Hi, my name is Martin Kuberic. I'm a member of the Syncom Smalltalk engineering team. I work primarily on networking and security stuff. Um, welcome to the last talk of the day. We almost made it through. I'm afraid, I've, I'm afraid I have to admit I probably have more material than so I can make next 40 minutes feel like three hours, but uh, we'll just take it slow and see where we'll, we'll, where we'll get. So uh, for those who didn't read the short blurbs on the program, extreme S, plural, is basically a, an attempt to try and implement a streaming library slightly differently. Uh, it's something that uh, Michael Lucas Smith and myself we've been playing with for embarrassingly long, probably more than two years now. Um, we both have quite a bit of, uh, done quite a bit with uh, the, the class extremes, especially in the context of various networking protocols. And um, so we were both fairly confident that we know pretty much everything there is to know about streams. Um, we used to entertain ourselves by exchanging war stories about how this and that in the classic stream, especially in visual works primarily, sucks and what on earth they were thinking when, did, when they did that. So we were bound to get to the point where we started asking ourselves, so what would we do if we wanted to make something better? And so that's how extremes started. Um, I'll need to sit down because a lot of this is going to be hands-on and uh, I can type standing. So, uh, yeah, this first slide, originally I didn't want to put it on. I tried to rationalize why. I don't want to talk about why, but the more I tried, the more obvious it became. This is going to be the first question anyone is going to ask. So... To say the truth, as I said, we were both fairly confident that we knew what streaming should be and how it is, so we went into the project with a lot of opinions. I have to admit I hold a very few of them at this point. Um, it was an interesting project. We've, I learned a lot and very humbling as well. Um, what we have today looks nothing like the first versions we committed some two years ago. Uh, uh, but I think we do have something worth talking about, and uh, we, we might be up to something interesting. So uh, on a more serious note, the issues in general terms that we uh, had with the, uh, with the classic library was uh, the, the way they evolved. They are just aren't consistent enough in a sense that if you try to do something more interesting with an internal stream and then try to run the same code with an external stream, you are bound to run into issues. Uh, another thing that I still believe today is that the way the hierarchy, at least in VisualWorks, is organized right now where you have stream right underneath, you have peakable stream uh, right underneath, you have positionable stream, and they are really just, you know, every other stream is pretty much subclass of positionable, which creates some sort of, or, or, or causes some unnecessary constraints on what you can do with a stream. There are many, many streams out there that simply aren't positionable, aren't naturally peakable, and uh, trying to accommodate those scenarios with the existing library is just difficult. And uh, the other thing that we both agreed on is that uh, read and write streams really have nothing, nothing in common. If you look at the APIs, they're completely different. And so all those read-write streams in the hierarchy, again, make, the, make, the, make it harder to create something with a consistent and, and clean uh, uh, behavior across all types of scenarios. Uh, we also care a lot about scalability, especially in the context of networking protocols. You know, if you want to make decent HTTP server, things just have to be fast. You know, uh, you cannot make any uh, expensive assumptions. Also, we wanted to try some new things like, uh, you know, in the collection hierarchy, you have all these wonderful things like collect, select, whatever. 
which are very handy but don't scale. Uh, and uh, there's really no reason why you can't have something similar in a stream context where uh, you can make it scalable. Those things can evaluate lazily and, and you don't have to pay any upfront cost to, to use these operations and you can build similar very interesting abstractions this way. So that was another reason why we wanted to experiment with some of these ideas as well. I have a, I have a yes? question. Just on the strict separation between read and write stream. So when we, when Damien, in fact, re-implemented the using traits, the, the stream collection of Squeak, okay, we, we got a lot of this inconsistency and things like that and mm -hmm. um, curse index that were in between uh, element and crazy stuff. Yeah. Now, now w the feedback that we got when we presented the Nile library mm -hmm. is that people told us, oh, no, we don't want read and write. We want them both. So we said, okay, just use two traits, read and both, read mm -hmm. and write, and then you get it. Do you have case that shows that you really want this? For me, I don't really care, but I would like to know if your experience, if the strict separation was really useful in practice on your, when you use your library. Well, I have to admit that the library didn't see too much use. I think we are at the point now where we would like to actually put it through some paces and prove to ourselves that, you know, it's really, you know, able to hold its own. But uh, I think that uh, in majority of the cases, a read-write stream is really a fake. It's really two streams in one. Uh, if you look at the regular read-write stream, uh, what is the position? Is it the read one or is it the write one? Right? Most often, you know, uh, m most often then you see, oh, well, suddenly I have a write position and a read position. You know, there's a lot of this sort of discrepancies that just don't feel right. The only case that I th where I think you sort of uh, have a read-write stream is files, which, uh, uh, which have particularly specific, you know, peculiar behavior in that sense where the position is sort of both of read, both read and write, depending on which mode you open the file and, and so on. But it, in pretty much any other case, uh, if you want something that you can send read and write to, well, just make a wrapper and put two streams inside. If you want to just have it packaged as one object, it's pretty simple wrapper that you could, uh, you could have for, for, for that. But in general, I, in my experience, I rarely see that I would need that sort of thing. So, uh, so let's, uh, let's get at it. Uh, uh, quick crash course on what extremes are today. Um, generally, any content that comes out of a stream or goes into a stream has to end up somewhere in a collection, f come from a socket, go into a file. We call these things terminals. That's where the content comes from or ends, or ends up with. Then we have, of course, read stream and write stream. Read stream has its source, which is, a, is generally a terminal. You can get an element out of it or can read several elements out of it. Similarly, write stream has a destination. You can put an element in or you can write a number of elements in. And uh, if you take that abstraction further, of course, a source or a destination can be another stream. And uh, we call these streams where sources and transform uh, and uh, our destinations are other streams transforms because in general in this case those streams do something with that stuff that's going through either it's turning it into something else or filtering them or you know some more pragmatic transformations are character encodings compression well, all kinds of things so we call these uh, once once you start putting streams on top of streams you get these sorts of stacks of streams and so the bottom one we always call the terminal stream and any any of the intermediate including the top one would generally be a transform stream uh, as far as the api goes it's uh, we chose to change the standard classic api a little bit i don't want to spend the presentation arguing about it why so we can talk about it later but uh, we decided uh, that we distinguish the single element operations from the collection, from the bulk operations. So, so to get a single element, you do a get. You to uh, read uh, read multiple, you use the read operation, and you have all the all the variations: read into a collection, read into a collection at a certain position, and so on. 
A read stream has the up to and equivalent is called rest, and you can get access to a source, to the source of the stream, which can be another stream, a terminal, or whatever. Uh, we also uh, added the iteration protocol collection style, which is not the main thing that I mentioned earlier, but uh, you can simply iterate over all the element as, as, as with a collection, sort of a polymorphic uh, behavior with collections. So you can do collect select on a stream, but that's, that's an immediate operation. It's just going to exhaust the, the entire stream. So for some quick and simple examples, uh, Another thing that's uh, new with uh, the Extremes API, the way you create streams, we decided to use this sort of Garand form of, of uh, so you, to create a stream, read stream, you would say reading. And uh, just, just to sort of connotate the progressive nature of the computation, that it's gonna happen later on as you, as you use the stream. So, to create a read stream on a string, to get an element out of it, to read four of them, to read the rest of the stream, that sort of thing. So a slightly more interesting example, uh, what if we want to treat the object memory as a stream? Oh, yes, sorry? Pardon? All oh, right, yes, uh, that's another th uh, good point. That's something I wanted to talk about and forgot. So if we do another, uh, if we do a get, we get an exception. This is uh, something that uh, uh, is different in that sense that in, at least in visual works, if you do next, you get a nil, unless you put a handler around it, in which case you get an exception. Uh, uh, we believe that uh, the right behavior is you always get an exception. I could use a mouse here. Um, in, uh, in classic streams, if you get a nil only if you use next, if you use next colon, you get an exception. So that's another inconsistency that's all, that, that always bothered me. And in general, returning a nil just feels, uh, feels like a hack, you know. There's nothing invalid about nil. It can be a completely valid element. So yeah, in next streams, you strictly get an exception. The exception, exception is called incomplete, and it has uh, several parameters. Uh, oh, how do I get the, I would have to catch the exception actually to see it in our debugger. Uh, never mind, you get, yes? Uh, in visual works, there's a notification called end of stream. Uh, notifications by their nature, if you don't handle them, they just fall off the table. And, and there's a default return value in that case, which in visual works is nil. So the way it works, there's an, there's, there is an exception raised, but if you don't handle it, you get the nil on, you know, somehow quietly. But if you decide you can handle the notification, in which case you will get, the, the, your handler will get, in, get invoked and, uh, and uh, but I mean, if you do next colon, you won't get nil. No, you will get a different next exception, which is called incomplete next count. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, slightly more interesting example. Here I want to treat the object memory as a, as a stream. Uh, object memory has primitive, two primitives. One gives you an object, and then you can ask it for get, to give you next object in memory after this one. Uh, so we can model that in extremes by using a block as a terminal. Uh, in this case, the, the way this works is that basically the block gets evaluated if you ask for an element of, of the stream and whatever it, reter it returns, that's the element. If you ask for another element, it just runs the block again, that's it. So as simple as that. So here we'll have, get the first object, then uh, to get the next one, we will always ask for next object after. And the way it works, if you get a zero, it only iterates over the, all the non-immediate objects. So zero wouldn't be part of that set. But if you get a zero, that means you, you, you enumerate the, enumerated the entire memory. So here we simply count uh, how many objects we have. So there's roughly one and a half million objects in this image. So this shows how to use, uh, this, this example shows uh, also the uh, enumeration API on the read stream down here. 
Um, so let's uh, move forward. Brightstream is also basically straightforward. We have methods called put for, for writing single element and write variations to write collections of elements. Uh, we also added uh, insert, uh, which is often useful, so uh, you can actually insert into a stream at the current position, but this operation really only is interesting for positionable streams. And on a non-positionable stream, inserting at the end of stream is equivalent of, the right, uh, of using a write. So a few examples here, we, uh, you create streams by saying writing to a terminal or uh, so string new writing gives us a stream, we can write a string into it. When we close the stream, uh, it, it has the same behavior as a classic small talk, the underlying collection will be had get grown as necessary. And when you, but uh, what's different is that when you close that stream, we will actually trim the collection to the actual content. Uh, part of the reason uh, why we do this, do this is because we don't like content on, on a write stream uh, because it's, for one, it doesn't work everywhere as one would expect and it's actually difficult to make it work. Uh, we actually have, we were just discussing NAR uh, recently which shows that and uh, the other thing, it's also a read operation on a write stream that doesn't make much sense either. So. Uh, the way this, uh, so as sort of a substitute for that, if we close the, if we say that the close on a simple collection stream trims the collection back down, then if you go back to the, the source of the collection, you get the actual content or whatever the, the actual content would be. And sometimes you get even something more efficient because that's the collection, you don't, make, you don't get another copy. If you ask for it twice, you get the same thing both times. Um, Another interesting thing about the write API is that for the write API, you don't have to write just from collections. You can actually r use a read stream as the source of the write API, which uh, immediately solves a common issue. You to, copy, to copy a stream into, a, into another stream, you always have to write this silly loop of, you know, read stream at end while false, you know, get me an element, put, put, put it into the other stream which is terribly inefficient in many cases. If you try to be a bit smarter, you have to make a buffer, you copy into the buffer, write, you know, write into the buffer, read into it, and so on. With this API, what we can actually do is that we can double dispatch between the two streams to the point that if you copy from one collection stream to another, it boils down to a single copy operation, right? You, you are not losing that information that you can use to actually implement this sort of operation efficiently. Um, the conclusion here is just a, an API that does, is a, so just a shortcut for close and terminal uh, the, as is used above, that's just to show that that's what often used. So here we write just first five elements from the source stream into the target. So uh, what kind of terminals can you use with extremes? Um, Obviously, collections, and here you see also the probably the simplest examples of uh, of each. I mentioned that you can read from blocks. You can also write into blocks. Uh, what that means is the block has to take a single argument and writing an element into it evaluates the block with the argument. Whatever happens, happens, and that's the end of it. If you write another one, we again evaluate the block with the argument, whatever the, the block does. Uh, so here in this, exa this example, you have uh, you can see dev null in small talk. This block is not going to do anything. Whatever you write into it, it's just going to throw it away. Uh, the uh, the other example is a stream infinite stream of nils. Uh, you can obviously read write into to and from files, sockets, and pipes. So reading from standard in would look like. Uh, would uh, look like here, down here. Buffers are something that we need internally for, yes? From an, from an, an infinite? I mean, uh, what if I want to make some uh, non-infinite stream made uh, out of block? Uh, the way, yeah, uh, actually, it's sort of shown down here. 
Here is a block, uh, block stream. And yeah, normally we will try to evaluate this as long as, you know, uh, forever, every time you ask for something, except if the, you make the block to return incomplete at some point or raise incomplete at some point, then the stream knows I'm at the end. So this is exactly what happens here. When we reach, when we, when we get zero out of next object of, from object memory, we simply raise incomplete. And from that point on, the stream will know it's at the end. So that's how you do it with the block. So yeah, buffers, shared queues, and uh, this thing you can read down there, that's C pointers, another, just an interesting experiment. You can actually treat external heap as a source or destination of a stream, so you can act. Yes, I know, it just says C pointers. I'll, I'll, I'll actually have a slide which actually shows how it works. So a few of the more interesting examples, here is how would you do uh, a Fibonacci stream. So zero now. Here we have a block. You swap the two variables, add to the other one. Pretty obvious. So then the 100 Fibonacci number would be this. And you treat it as any other stream. Uh, everything should be working consistently. Um, another interesting example uh, of a block stream for writing. Here, this block is going to take its argument, make a print string, turn it into compose text, and display it on this window, in, you know, incrementing the position somewhat. So if we write another 30 numbers from the Fibonacci, I shouldn't have printed, that doesn't make sense. But anyway, you get the point. The block can do anything, right? Whether it receives the number, does something with it. In this case, it's printing it on, uh, on the, uh, on this slide. So uh, we find that the, the block streams are actually very interesting thing. You can do all kinds of very interesting uh, uh, you can, for example, model an arbitrary loop as a block uh, and sort of control the iteration through the stream operations, right? You can make next 20 iterations by reading from a block which is could be a body of a for loop and then later read another to 30. You know, you, there's, a, there's a lot of interesting tricks that we could probably come up with. Uh, pipes might be interesting. Uh, it's uh, in uh, visual works, you can set up, a, open a pair of pipes. One is, th this is in a, if it, with pipe accessors, one is for write reading, the other one is for writing. So this one just ran, uh, Hello, through through a actual Unix pipe here. We can write into the standard out. Why do I do prints? I should do do it. Uh, so let's if I can hit the right button. It will eventually happen. So uh, I got few hellos on the screen now. Uh, we can read from standard in. I probably hit enter there already, uh, so now I can type D, let's say, and here we get the number back. The, 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 the pipe streams are naturally binary. If you want to things turned into characters, you need to apply an encoding transform on top of it, which we'll see a little bit later. Um, here is the C pointer example. Uh, so we need to allocate the space on the external heap. So let's say 50 chars. Uh, then you just say tell to the buffer. You, the result of this is a C pointer. Uh, if you know a little bit of DLCC and visual works. Uh, to create a stream on it, you tell the pointer to uh, use the writing uh, method. Uh, you set the length just so it's sort of a safety measure so that the, the C pointer doesn't know how much space is actually allocated on the heap in order, you know, to help you to stay in control and not to write over the, over the memory boundaries and such. Uh, it's good. You, you, you should set the size of, this, of the write stream as well. It will actually automatically grow. So if you write more than, more than 50 characters, it will reallocate new chunk of memory on the heap free the old one or copy it over, free the old one and film it. It, it will exa behave exactly like a collection stream. 
And uh, so here we have uh, an example where we will first uh, write hello world onto the heap and then we will read it back in. The content species API allows to override the default, what, what, what the stream thinks the content species is by default. So normally it would think it's binary, but here if we want the read stream, we can tell, uh, turn, you know, turn, use byte string instead as the, as the content type. So here it is, hello world back from the sea land. So that's the terminals. The possibly more interesting side of extremes is the, is the transforms. Uh, at this point, there's a number of different types of transforms available in the extremes library. There's the basic set of, uh, like I called it collection style transforms, which behave similarly as the collection APIs do. So you can have a collecting transform on top of a stream which takes each element, runs it through the block, whatever the block returns, that's the new, that's the real value that the transform is gonna be returning. You can use selecting which basically filters, you can skip some of the elements that are coming from the source, injecting, doing, all kinds of stuff. Doing is primarily to cause side effects as the elements are going through. You can do whatever with the element on the side as it's flowing through that transform to the, to the, to the upper levels. There's obviously a bunch of specialized transforms that any pra practical s library needs. Character encoding, base64 encoding, we have cryptographic, cryptographic transforms, compression, interpreting and marshalling are about turning bytes into C type, or into, into objects really. Um, and then finally we have uh, a general transform which I really would like to uh, get to hopefully in time, which I find very interesting, is it's how to express arbitrary transforms in general. It, the, the collection styles are sort of limited in a sense that you can turn one element into one element or you can filter out some, so ter turning few elements into one, but you cannot make turn one element into three, for example. You know, so in general, a transform needs to be able to read arbitrary number of elements, possibly none, and generate arbitrary num number of elements, possibly none. So, uh, so I think we came up with pretty interesting uh, way how to capture that uh, with the transforming stream. And then there's also substreams, which uh, the idea there is that you often have complex content and you would like to treat parts of it as streams of their own. And the content is coming from the stream and you don't want to be, you, you don't want to have to just read it out into memory and then, you know, uh, do it do it the the classic way. There's really no reason why you shouldn't be able to do it straight as it's coming from a socket through a decompressor through encryption or whatever. So uh, unless there are questions, let's let's go through some of the examples. First one is uh, let's uh, we can we can treat the random gen uh, generator as a stream but normally that returns floats between zero and one. Uh, what if we want simple but random byte stream? Well, you just can set up a collecting transform on top of it and multiply the number by 256, take floor, and uh, you should get, uh, you should get uh, zero to 255. And if you want those really behave as a byte array, so if you ask for 20, you want a byte array instead of array, just set content species. So, uh, yeah, so if we ask random for read five, there we go. Uh, the other example is slightly more complex. Here we want a stream of, uh, of primes. So here we, yes? You use the same variable. Um, so that means the first stream gets copied and held by the second stream. Yes, yes, yes. So it's, yeah, it's yeah. The, the first stream becomes the source of the second stream. Without right? being overwritten by itself. Sorry? Without being overwritten by itself. Overwritten? What do you mean by? Well, if you, if you treat it lazily, then... Um, 
the confusion is that I'm using the same variable for in the example. Yeah, those could be two different variables. Yeah, maybe. Yes, yes of course, that's what I would yeah. have expected. Okay, so. okay, maybe, yeah. The, the problem is, you know, we are trying to fit something onto a small slide in a fairly large font, so. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe I, yeah, maybe a bit more, de more reused than I should have <laughs> used here. But yeah, basically you are building the stack. All I really need to hold on to is the top of the stack, right? So primes, the, the method that we're using here is a simple prime sieve. So the sieve is gonna be the collection of primes we already know, initially none. Then we create an infinite stream of ones. We turn that into infinite stream of integers from one to forever by applying a transform. Uh, the transform is simply add one to the previous element so this gives us, uh, so I should start evaluating this. This gives a stream that starts from two to, and goes forever. And finally, to get, pri get, to get the prime stream, uh, we take the two and up, and we start rejecting numbers which are not primes. The way you do it, well, you ask the sieve, do you have any element in there that divides this number? If it is, then it's not a prime and we need to throw it away. Uh, otherwise, that's a prime and we should return it as the value. But there's one more thing we need to do. If it is a prime, we need to add it to the sieve so that we not know next time that this is a prime. Uh, so, it's this thing. And so if we want to read first 10 primes, here we go. Uh, yes? In this example, the stream primes does not have any memory more than just one, what, more than the previous element. It doesn't no, no, the, we, we keep the memory of all the previous primes in the sieve in collection. The sieve, because yeah. the, the stream does not remember. No, stream, yes, yeah. Just one because you're using, oh, no, I, if you inject into something, then you have one mem mem a memory of one of the previous. Yes, yes, the, in the, the, yeah. The injecting transform is sort of strange. If you do injecting transform on top of a stream, you are not getting one result. You are getting a sequence of all the results as, it, as, as the value sort of evolves while it iterates over the stream. So yeah, the, the result of an injecting transform is again a stream of values, but it's just the one that gets passed through, yeah. So yeah, that's, uh, that's why it's useful uh, in, for example, cases like this. So uh, a slightly more pragmatic examples, character encoding. Uh, we reuse the same encoding infrastructure in visual works as the classic streams uh, use. I mean, it's a lot of work to come up with something better and there, there's a lot of stuff already done there. So at this point, there wasn't really a reason not to reuse what's there. So in extremes, you, let's say we read, uh, create a stream on top of the changes file you just say encoding to get a transform for character encoding, give it the name of the encoding, and then you can read whatever first 50 characters of, of that file. Since it's a file stream, it should be closed, of course. Uh, the second example, maybe I shouldn't have even included that, but basically uh, encodings are, in general, en encoding is an, an expensive operation uh, because of the nature of, uh, you know, if you don't know what the encoding is, that can, uh, so, so the encoding transform itself cannot make many assumptions. But often it might be useful f uh, to avoid that for sp certain ki kinds of encodings. In, in visual works, a byte string is naturally, is, is sort of a byte array where each byte is interpreted as ISO 8591 character. So if you are gonna be using ISO 88591 or Latin one, I believe, uh, then, uh, then there's no point to incur the cost of uh, the encoding, and you can use tricks like this, where this, uh, when we open the file, uh, this is a binary stream, but if I set it contents species to string, then I can read from it, and I get the same result, right? Without the overhead of the general encoding infrastructure. So that's often useful. Uh, of, however, in this, if you use something like this, you uh, won't get aligned in translation. 
So that's again something that the encoding transform does for you. Uh, the, the difference we have in extremes is that the read stream encoding transform will translate, there's a mode where it will translate line dents from any convention to the small talk one rather than you having to say, you know, in, in the classic streams in visual works, you just have to pick one or you tell it to figure out which one it is, but it's always just one. And if, it ha if you happen to run across a different one in there, you'll just get LFs or whatever in, in, your, in, in the result. In our case, we will be translating any sort of convention to, to CRs, period, which we think is more practical than the other behavior. So here, if we look at the elements, we had 10s and 13s there mixed, but it really interprets all of them as a, as a CR character. Similarly, on the right stream, uh, by default, it will do the platform line and convention. So on Linux, we would get 10. On Windows, we would get 13, 10. So that, but it's something important to remember. I mean, if you, you can use only the, the speed, speedy trick if you really can handle the line and conversions yourself or it doesn't matter or whatever. So uh, the cryptographic ones are fun. Uh, here is, let's take the image file of this image and we are just gonna hash the whole thing with MD5. Uh, this was pretty quick. I believe this image is probably close to 50 megabytes. Uh, the reason why it's quick is we are basically feeding it to OpenSSL in fairly large chunks. So that's nice. This is a fairly weak machine with some Atom processor, so, so, yes? Sorry? Oh, yes, uh, yeah, the, so what this does, we will create a read stream on the file, we will set up a hashing transform on, on, on top of it, and this is basically seek to the end, go to the end of the stream. Otherwise, I, I don't wanna read the file into memory, I just want to, want it to say, you know, go to the end. And so the hashing transform in that mode, it will still, you know, the, the, the content will still get, go through the memory, but you, I don't have to read the whole thing. It will, just, it will just flow through the buffers. The hashing transform will do its thing. And, uh, and so uh, then after you're done, after you read whatever you want, you have to close it so that the hashing transform knows that that's the final because there's some more that it needs to be done to compute the MD5 hash to finalize the hashing. And so then after the stream is closed, you can ask the hashing transform what, the di what is the digest? What is the value, the DMD5 value? Yes? I guess you have a huge uh, hierarchy of transforms where you have implemented MD5 as a separate class and then this hashing is just an accessory. No, as I, I mentioned, we are using OpenSSL uh, libcrypto here. So actually the hierarchy is pretty tiny. Uh, that would be in extras. So we have for read stream, we have cipher read stream, digest read stream. That's it. So the the uh, the, the hash is just a parameter so, for the. So the stream is actually the openness is a name for the hash algorithm. Yes, yes. Okay. It, that's it. Okay. We just pass it over, pass it through. Yeah. So a uh, more interesting example. Uh, Let's say we want to take the object comment, we want to encode it in UTF-8, we want to compress the result, encrypt it using AES, and then finally encode it into Base64 to get a string. <coughs> Sorry. So this is all it takes. So uh, yeah, uh, the, in the interesting, I think, aspect in this example is that yeah, so far I said you can stack streams on streams on top of transforms on top of transforms, but one thing you need to be careful about, the, the subsequent transforms need to be compatible, right? If a transport's produced, transform produces bytes, what's underneath needs to take bytes. It cannot be something that takes characters. If it's, if it's not compatible, it's just gonna blow up somewhere in the middle of the operation. But uh, uh, we were briefly thinking about maybe putting in some sort of uh, m uh, mechanism to figure out if two streams are compatible and complain at construction time, but that's just too difficult in general case. I mean, we might be able to have some partial success in some scenarios, but 
I don't I don't see a reasonable solution in general case to figure out if two, two, two transforms are compatible or not. So we just gave up on that and it's up to the user to figure that out. <coughs> oh, sorry. <coughs> so uh, that was the more interesting specialized transforms. Now we are getting, I would I like to talk about the generalized transformations, general, general transformations. So the example I want to use is uh, uh, transforming, uh, translating Morse code. Uh, Morse code is the thing where you have short beeps and long beeps and some combinations of them uh, 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 denote letters. So here we have a message. Thank you. Here we have a message. Is there anyone who already knows what it is? <laughs> Uh, the way uh, to decode, uh, one way to decode Morse code is use the sort of uh, Morse code tree. So if you take, let's say, the last, le last uh, letter here, starts with long, short, short, long. The way you would decode it using the tree is you start at the top. If you get the long, you go to the left. If you get a short, you go to the right. So in this case, it would be long, short, short, long, and you end up at the X. So the last letter is X. So... Uh, to write a transform for this, uh, let's say we have the Morse tree encoded in a form of nested arrays where the first element is the letter of that node and the second element is the tree on the left, third element is the tree on the right. So the way you need to decode it is you read whatever dot or, or hyphen and uh, if it's a dot, you move to the node on the right. If it's a hyphen, you move to the node on the left. That's down here. And if you hit a space, here, this is a space, really. If you hit a space, then uh, that's the end of the letter. And so in that case, you get out of this loop, and you look at what the first node of the current node is. So for each letter, we start from the top of the, from the root of the tree, and you iterate over while you read anything else than a space, and move through the notes as, as you go. And uh, so that's the algorithm. And uh, the nice thing is that you can express it exactly that way in the transformation block. The way the transformation block works is you get two param parameters, in and out, where in is the stream of elements coming into the transform, and out is, again, a stream of elements going out. In all cases, one of these is sort of a virtual stream. It doesn't exist. In this case, we are reading, so the in is a real stream, but the out is not a stream. That's whatever is coming out of the transform, but you treat it as a stream. That's the, that's, the, that's the key here. So that way you can decide whatever number of elements you want to read from the input and write whatever number of elements you want into the, uh, into the output. And uh, it seems to work fairly nice for, fairly well for expressing the transformations in, 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 a, in a very simple way. So this reads, I, I believe this code reads pretty much as what I was showing on the tree example. And so here we have our message decoded. Um, uh, right uh, streams are work exactly the same way. You get an in, in stream, which is virtual stream of elements that are written or will be written into the stream and out is the thing that's underneath that is going to consume the output. So you can actually use the exact same block with the write streams and read streams. <coughs> now, if we want the write stream to generate the Morse code for us, we obviously cannot use the block we used before because that was the inverse transformation. So we need a new one. So here, here we have a simple dictionary that maps each letter to whatever the sequence of dots and hyphens. Yes? All right, yeah, this is the most interesting example, so I'll wrap it up soon. <laughs> I think, I like it. Uh, so yeah, the transformation here is pretty simple. Read a letter, map it through the dictionary, spit out whatever the value is. So to get back the original message, here we go. So uh, yeah, substreams are more complicated topic we won't be able to get into. I, I'd be happy to discuss with whoever's interested later. I quite enjoy this project. I think there's some 
interesting stuff here that that could be could 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 be useful. Uh, the last topic that I'm not going to cover, the, the whole issue of positioning and positioning streams and how we deal with that in the extremes hierarchy, it also gets uh, uh, interesting. I guess I could uh, highlight the main differences between the classic library now and, and wrap up with that. So we have strictly separated read and write. I think that was beneficial in terms of the API is still fairly minimal. You don't get the slew of methods. Uh, the composition and the stacks allow us to actually trim the API down significantly. We don't need methods like up to all where, which basically gives you whatever is in the read stream up to something. We solve that using the substreams by just setting up a substream that is going to finish when it reaches that pattern or this sort of thing. So there, there's a, it, it gives you more expressive power and you actually get more with less API just by combining the concepts the right way, I believe. Uh, the stream end handling is consistent. It's always incomplete. You get incomplete out of uh, write streams as well if this write stream actually has a natural limit. When, when it hits the limit, it's going to raise an incomplete. The incomplete exception, we took a lot of, a lot of care and effort to make sure that it, it always if it's possible, it's going to tell you how much it actually ended up writing or how much it ended, succeeded to read, uh, where, where it put those elements, where they start, if it's, a, if it's a collection. So you always get a lot of information for the incomplete uh, exception, all, all you could actually get for, for that operation and act, act accordingly. There are things that uh, might be interesting. For example, we don't have at end. Uh, at end, in general, is a difficult thing. In, gen in most general cases, you just have to do a read. Uh, otherwise, you cannot really answer that question if, if a stream is at end. Uh, we have, uh, I'll try to show some, some uh, patterns here, how to replace various uh, uh, st uh, standard patterns with, the, with an extremes equivalent. Uh, I think that pretty much sums it up uh, as far as the differences go. The topics that I don't, didn't cover at all that are there is the all interpreting and marshalling, meaning turning bytes into, into objects. There's a lot of interesting stuff there. Michael also did a lot of experiments with peg parsing, so there's an entire package for, peg, for pegs and peg parsing uh, on t using extremes. Uh, so I think at this point, uh, I think we are at a point where the APIs, we are reasonably happy with the API and uh, we think we won't be changing it next week three times again. So I think we are at a point where it would be useful to actually uh, make some experiments and see if what we've got is really, really good enough or if we need to work on it some more. Uh, the project uh, has a uh, Google project site uh, the URL is here. We wanted it primarily as having a website for the project. The documentation gets generated straight out of code, straight into the site, so the, the documentation should be pretty up to date on the website pretty much all the time. The code doesn't live there because we don't want to convert, you know, output it for uh, uh, Mercurial or, or, or Git. I think it's there. So it just lives in the, small, uh, in the Syncom public repository at this point. So that's it. That's all I have at this point. Thank you very much. I don't know if do we have any time for questions still or yes, okay, so So uh Martin you are talk you are working in an area where you don't have the full freedom. So uh that is there you know there is a small doc standard and yep. the small doc standard covers in 23 pages what uh, Streams is all about. It doesn't go into the details of implementation as the entire standard does not, but uh, as we as the, have agreed more than 12 years ago to use that standard, uh, it's not something visual work specific where Syncom per se can decide what they want to do. It is something where there is a standard. How do you, come, how do you play with the, that standard? Uh, we don't. I, um, 
For one, I think the standards make some of the mistakes that I think the basic library does, like the whole issue around read-write streams and, uh, sorry? The, uh, well, but the, the, the way the protocols are organized, the read stream, I believe, I looked at it recently, uh, has to support the interface where, which is positionable. So uh, I, th I believe every write stream is supposed to understand contents, for example, and, and these sorts of things. Uh, I mean, ultimately, yes, maybe we cannot call this the standard small talk streams. It's extremes. Uh, uh, I don't think we will be able to uh, ever morph the classic stream library into extremes. I think it's just something different. I'm not sure I, we can really reconcile it with the NC standard. Just for history, I would like to mention a very old paper from Wilf Lalonde or uh, uh, people from Ottawa, implementation of backtracking using streams, which is very interesting. Mm -hmm. What's the license for the code? Uh, it's MIT license, uh, copyright, SINCOM, Michael Lucas Smith and myself. That's the state and I believe that's what it's going to stay in. I got a question for the naming of the standard messages you use. Um, mm -hmm. I thought uh, all over the place, reading, writing, transforming, these are uh, words using the progressive form. How did you come up with that? Because it's, for me, it's a bit strange to, strange to read in small talk code. Well, yes, I mean, uh, I think, I guess we, we try to come up with something reasonably convenient to script with, right? I mean, part of this is to be able to express something easily and uh, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the progressive form appealed to us because it's something exactly, it's something not very often, to u often used, so it is gonna stand out and be more of an indicator that okay, here is a stream being created or, or a transform being created, you know. Is it the right choice? Is it the wrong choice? I think there is a lot of subjective hand waving we could do. Um, you know, if we have something better. I mean, it's certainly not the fundamental part of this. We can certainly create the transforms by calling the class on whatever. And uh, but then you get into the whole issue of, you know, the example where I showed the you know encryption and uh, whatnot. That would turn into full page of bracketed stuff. Uh, well, I would argue that uh, the is what you created is a kind of the protocol from my point of view with this reading, writing, and so on. Yes, and yes. And I think this is very fundamental for this kind. I'm, I mean fundamental not from the point of view of making the stacking possible. We didn't have to do that, I, uh, but I agree. This is very much part of the API at this point. And yes, we need to be, API design is hard. Uh, <laughs> Do we, did we do the right thing? I don't know. Um, I think at this point, this is just up to other people interested to suggest changes, agree, disagree, discuss. I mean, uh, so far it was really sort of between Michael and myself because the whole thing was going through such changes. I mean, we rewrote the whole thing from scratch a number of times in those two years. And it's really sort of irresponsive to start selling it to people like, you know, you know, go try this, this is cool. And then two weeks later, I, I rewrite it completely from scratch and the other poor person is stuck and, you know, adjusting again to all, all those changes. So uh, that's why I think we are getting, we are at now at the point where what we think, what we have is probably best we can come up with at this point that's probably not the best thing that it could be, but uh, you know, at this point, I don't, I don't think we are able to improve it much more ourselves, and probably could use external input on how how to go forward. Martin, what did you believe when you started that two years later you don't believe about what was wrong with the original streams? 
Uh, I had a lot of very strong opinions. I remember, I'm not sure I remember them all. Um, one thing, I think I was pretty vocal even about that I think at end is just wrong. You just should never use at end uh, in your code, period. But uh, I don't think that position is really um, uh, practical. I mean, uh, I don't think we got away from at end in extremes. We just don't have that method. But if you want to read something to the end of the stream, you just have to handle the exception and, and uh, deal with it that way. It's not getting rid of at end. Uh, the, I think the, the, at that time, the reason why I was ca coming from was more from the networking protocol point of view. Protocols that rely on the end of the stream are just badly designed protocol. The messages, the individual elements of the protocol should be really self-delimited, clearly contained, because uh, you know, in networking, stuff goes wrong, connections break. And if you rely on end of the stream being the end of the message, then you, have, then you will get into a situation where the connection just broke and the end of the message isn't really the end of the message. It just didn't get, you just didn't get the whole thing. So I think a lot of this, I just wanted to, you know, sort of admit that uh, designing a streaming library might seem simple on the outset even though you think you have a lot of experience, but uh, actually sitting down and implementing something reasonable may surprise you. <laughs> but I think it might probably applies to, to, to many of many projects. So um, I'm, I'm trying to remember, but I don't, so bear with me. Uh, a long time ago at Interval, I think Kyleta, I don't know how to pronounce his name, uh, made a lot of work on streams and he rewrote the hierarchy completely mm -hmm. and I think he called it either flow or um, conduits or it's the same or flow is an implementation of conduits or something. I just want to know if you took a look at it because I, I remember it was completely different and you might get good names out of it, if mm -hmm. at least something. I think I looked at flow unless I'm confusing it's, it's, it. It's quick. Yeah, yeah. Uh, unless I confuse it with something but I think flow was a little bit more about like process synchronization kind of, I'm not sure I remember the details there, but it, it seemed to have different goals than what we, were, what we are trying to do here. I mean, extreme is really about being able to treat, if you have an algorithm that does something with stream of characters, uh, let's say parses it as small talk code, Extremes is about making it possible to process the characters coming out of anywhere. It doesn't matter if it's from a collection or if it's, you know, from a socket somewhere or, you know, uh, and but the, the, it's, it's about making the abstraction of this is just a simple character stream, no matter what's underneath, right? And that's, that's the focus of this project. I think, uh, even the Nile project uh, had slightly different, uh, at least to some degree, different goals than, than what we were, what we are trying to achieve here. Yep. Um, I just wanted to thank you for, like, it's really interesting what you've done, and it's, you know, a lot of hard work, and appreciate that. Um, I don't see you. <laughs> I'm, I'm here. Oh, sorry. Uh, I just wanted to double check. So, is is Syncom really prepared to like make this MIT license, and is prepared for like other vendors and small talks to you know, it's assuming it went well, everyone implemented this, and we could just move ahead and have a different streaming thing? Is that is that what I'm hearing with the MIT licensing and copyright yes, to you guys? Yes, I believe we've had this this discussion internally already, and that it is out as MIT under whatever terms that license grants. So, yeah, I think it's okay to port this, do whatever, make yeah, it better. Kudos to Syncom on that one. I think that's nice. Yep. Yeah, I, I guess I'll speak semi-officially for Syncom. So 
Yes, it's not that we are prepared to, we have. It has been released under that license. Um, that involved a certain amount of interesting discussions with various levels within CINCOM. Um, but yes, it's, it's been given away. And I think the biggest reason for that is precisely because we think that would be the best value for us. If there's a better streaming library that's incompatible and were completely proprietary to us, doesn't really help that much. If, if everybody were actually prepared to move forward, then we only have the problem of 30 years of legacy code. <laughs> That's also kind of an interesting aspect. I, I don't think that you can really make radical progress with the existing library, certainly not in our context. There's just way too much uh, legacy out there. And what, whatever you try to do with something as low level as streams are, you're bound to cause a lot, wreak a lot of havoc, whatever, you know, with best intentions. There's just, I don't really see with the expectation of backward compatibility to be able to make dramatic differences or dramatic evolutionary steps with the classic library. So personally, I think if you want to make bigger progress, you really just have to start with something new, maintain both things side by side, and either people will start adopting the new thing or not, but the old thing is just not going away, not anytime soon, possibly not ever. Okay, thank you very much.